Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience today. My name is Laura Mullen, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Print Purchases Digital, How Traditional User Journeys Can Be Enhanced for a Digital Age, sponsored by Oxford University Press. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you'll see a chat panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We'll spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please feel free to submit them throughout. You'll also see a separate box for technical questions. Please feel free to use this feature for any technical difficulties you may be experiencing so our production team can tr troubleshoot them privately. Finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on accessing the archived version. Our speakers today are Professor Michael Suarez and Rupert Mann and Mackenzie Warren of Oxford University Press. Michael F. Suarez, SJ, is a university professor and director of Rare Book, the Rare Book School at University of Virginia, and has written many articles on various aspects of 18th century literature, bibliography, and book history. His most recent publication is The Oxford Companion to the Book, a million word reference co edited with H.R. Woodhausen on the history of books and manuscripts from the invention of writing to the present day. The Sunday Telegraph in London called it colossal and a paradise for book lovers, while the Wall Street Journal praised it as a font of knowledge where the internet is but a slot machine. A Jesuit priest, Michael is co-general editor with Leslie Higgins of the collected works of Gerard Manley Hopkins. His 2009 publication, The Cambridge History of the Book in Britain, Volume 5, 1695 through 1830, co-edited with M.L. Turner, was selected as a Book of the Year in the Times Literary Supplement. Among his current projects is Bibliography for Book Historians. Michael has also held research fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And Michael was nominated by President Barack Obama to be a member of the National Council on the Humanities. Rupert Mann joined Oxford University Press in 1996 to work on the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, first as data manager and then as electronic publication manager. After it was published in print and online in 2004, he's worked on a, a number of academic online products at OUP, and above all, the Oxford Scholarly Editions Online, for which he led the digital editorial team from the initial definitions of site architecture and functionality through the site build to launch in September 2012 and the publication of the first Latin content in 2015. Mackenzie Warren has worked in the Institutional Marketing Department at Oxford University Press since 2013, handling global communications and managing OUP's Library Advisory Council. Prior to joining OUP, she was part of the editorial team for the Modern Language Journal. And at this point, we are ready to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Suarez. I wanted to ask you to imagine a situation. Imagine, if you will, that you're a scholar sitting in a university library, and you make a great discovery. You come across something you never thought of before. You're reading Herman Melville's early novel, White Jacket. 
and you notice for the first time that Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, wrote about the soiled fish of the sea. And you think, aha, this is just like Moby Dick. This prefigures Moby Dick. And you write a scholarly article about it, and you publish it widely. And all the people in the world of American literature look at that, and they're confused because when they take their copies of White Jacket off their office shelves or they go into their university libraries, they see that it doesn't say the soiled fish of the sea at all. It says the coiled fish of the sea. This really happened. F. O. Matheson was a great American literary scholar, and he sullied his reputation by citing an unreliable edition and basing his whole interpretation on the word soil instead of coil. Later that year, not wholly because of this, F. O. Matheson defenestrated himself, jumped out a window, and killed himself partly because of his disgrace in the scholarly community. His actions might seem ridiculous to us. There wasn't that much at stake. He had to retract his article. But this terrible incident in the history of American literature makes us think about the importance of using the right edition, the importance of using a scholarly edition that's been properly edited and checked and rechecked, an edition that the community shares, of using an edition that people can go back to and look at a citation that's made in a scholarly article or indeed even in a classroom and make sure that everybody has the same text and that the text they're using is in fact the best text, and that everybody knows where it came from. Uh, this happens to me as a problem all the time in my teaching, for example. One student will have one edition of The Merchant of Venice, and another student will have another version, and a third student, yet another. And, and the text has enormous number of variations in it, but the editions that they have don't offer any common ground for them to discuss the text, nor do they have the scholarly apparatus to help those students understand where the editions come from. If you go, for instance, to the Project Gutenberg uh, edition of Merchant in of Venice Online, there is no metadata whatsoever about the source. So you can't know if it's a reliable text or not. So this is, this is really a problem, and uh, Oxford University Press tried to address this problem starting about five or six years ago. We got together a, a, a great scholarly team and um, put together an editorial board and started to, to ask ourselves and to reach out to the library community, the editing community, the community of philosophers and historians and literary scholars and say, how could we create a digital tool that would refer to stable textual objects that would be citable over and over again, that could be used for scholarship and teaching and student research in such a way that people would be able to cite the best texts available and that everybody would know exactly what was being cited and be able to return to it over and over again. And the answer to that question, over many years of investment, both individual and uh, corporate, as it were, has been Oxford Scholarly Editions Online, OSEO. Um, not just because of the problem of coiled and soiled, but also because if a university has one copy of a white jacket in the library and someone takes it out, then that's not accessible to anybody else in that university or college community. But with Oxford Scholarly Editions Online, that group of students can all be studying the same edition. 
And that seems to be really important, too. As a literature teacher since 1987, I can tell you that I very much need my students to be on the same page. So we've tried to build a digital tool that's based on print objects, but that transcends many of the limits of the printed object, both by being in more than one place at the same time, but also of allowing uh, searching, not just in one individual work, but of course corpora, of course uh, across uh, the whole Renaissance, the whole medieval period, or indeed the whole canon of English literature that's available to us on this tool. So what we've been trying to affect here is a new way of doing research, a more powerful way of doing research, and, and a new kind of pedagogical tool for the library and the classroom that enables instructors to broaden the canon that they teach and that enables instructors to make sure that their students can have the best uh, scholarly and critical apparatus available to them as they're making their way through these scholarly texts. And this seems to me a, a significant breakthrough in the digital delivery of uh, scholarly editions. And um, I'm very proud of the editorial team. And I'm, I'm very proud of what Rupert Mann, who's in your company today, and, and his uh, technical team have accomplished. Rupert? Michael, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, again, for your patience uh, before we got started. And before I explore how we try to address some of the needs that, that Michael has just unpacked for us when we put our scholarly editions online, I just want to tell you a few things about the RCO side. It contains scholarly editions published by OUP over the last 100 years. And we're adding to it all OUP's new critical editions, primarily in the field of English literature, but also works of philosophy and history and now Latin and Ancient Greek. We're adding content to it in chronologically defined chunks. So when we launched in 2012, we included works by Renaissance, Elizabethan, Jacobean writers. And we've been moving forward through history. This May, we just added the Romantics. And my manager, believing that I didn't have enough to do, asked me to open up a second front. So we've just started classics do. We've added Latin poetry. And we've now got 618 editions on the site. And of course, those editions contain many thousands of works of all different types. We're adding content four times a year. Coming soon is Latin history uh, as a Christmas treat, and then our first slice of Victorians in spring. Uh, a lot of Dickens, Browning, uh, Gladstone. So that's the broad story of the site. And when we came to design it, as Michael says, we spoke at length with him, with our editorial board, with other scholars, with librarians, with students about their needs. And unpicking some of the things that, that Michael's articulated, we realized that those potential users had two overarching demands from our project to put these editions online. First, they wanted the online versions to be absolutely identical to the print editions so they could be used and cited as if they were the print editions, but with the obvious digital benefit of being accessible across the whole of the internet. But at the same time, scholars wanted them to be completely different. They should make use of digital affordances to make the content of those editions more accessible, more discoverable, easier to use. And I'm going to talk about these two aspects. In short, we solve them with two technical approaches that we have in parallel. For the absolutely identical need, we have PDFs of the pages from the print editions. On completely different, we transform the content of those print editions into structured XML. We add metadata, and we present it in HTML. So I'm now going to 
move over and start looking at the site. So I'll be sharing my screen. And Osseo demands quite a lot of real estate. So you may want to maximize the screen that you see there, the button top right, or at least keep the, uh, the ancillary pane smaller. So I hope that right now you can see a browse editions list. Um, I would hope someone would shout if that's not the case. Um, so looking first of all at absolutely identical. Um, I'm sure that you're familiar with interfaces like this for the presentation online of books that have appeared in print. And here are our books. And you'll see here uh, names that you recognize, names that you may not recognize. Samuel G. Cook of Rye, I suspect, is a name you may not recognize. Ben Johnston, uh, we also have. We have some big sets here, too. The philosophers, in particular, um, Hobbes. We've got 30 volumes of Bentham. And now we've started adding the Latin, we have our Oxford classical texts. And it's good to see those here. So all these editions, just having them online would be a benefit. And so that's what we've done in flat editions. Let's look at an edition page. Here it is. Every single print page from this edition is up online as a PDF. Let's go to page 87 of Karina Williamson's edition of the visionary 18th century poet Christopher Smart. And there is our print PDF. So here is absolutely identical. It's clearly reassuring, and you know, we all share the secret that though everyone uses online resources, everyone wants to cite print resources. Um, and of course, this picture of the print page has all the stability and authority of print. Of course, with the obvious simple benefit of online, multiple copies for the institution. There's no scramble to get that one copy of White Jacket or, or Christopher Spot. Remote access, availability, wherever you can be online. Um, just seeing the, the list of, uh, of people turning up here, we have registrants here from several continents. And thanks to the internet, here we all are looking at Christopher Smart, considering his cat Jeffrey, uh, all in the same edition, all line 695 for I will consider my cat Jeffrey. So that's our absolutely identical access, supported by the print PDF. Let's take a look at the second need, that our online edition should be completely different. And that's what's supported by the XML and the HTML. Before we do that, we can just look at this print page, which exemplifies the elements of a scholarly edition that we're all very familiar with. The text, the lineation in the margin, the critical apparatus, not much here, editorial notes, another bank of notes, the classic elements of a scholarly. And this scholarly is, in fact, a very good exemplar. Tiny critical apparatus, very concise notes, we were able to typeset them all on the page. Normally, of course, with bigger set of notes, they get consigned to the back of the book or a supplementary volume. And that's the whole problem that users encounter. Do they bother looking at the notes? What we want is notes alongside the text. So let's look at our primary HTML-based presentation of that same thing. Here we are. You can see we've got three panes. We have a little map of our edition here. We've jumped to the right spot in the text here. Here we are considering Jeffrey. We have our notes here. And the notes are right alongside. If you want a note, you can click on a cue, and we spin to the note. So what we've tried to do is make the notes always present, always visual, but always available. 
If you're a textual critic, you're not interested in our editorial notes, well, let's turn them off. Let's just have the critical apparatus. If you just want to enjoy the text, we can just have that. So what we're trying to do is get the correct material visible, but also in a way which is not obtrusive. Then if we like, we can lock everything together and scroll through. The notes keep up with the text. Now, this is terrific for those banks of notes that are hidden at the back of a book. They're no longer hidden at the back of the book. They're up here. So this is our primary presentation of our print content. And you can see up at the top here, our pane is the beginning of fragment B, and it runs to the end of that fragment, the fantastic lines, for he can swim for life, for he can creep. And we can do that because we've identified fragment B as being an item in itself. It's not just the text that happens to be between a couple of pages in the print edition. And that's how I was able to say we've got 25,000 odd poems because we've identified each separate item in our, in our edition. In data terms, every work becomes an object. You can attach metadata to it, most obviously who wrote it. And of course, once you've got works identified as being by different authors, the site really starts coming alive. Because the most obvious way of approaching this massive content, all these thousands of works, is by coming in on the axis of authors and work. And so here is our simple alphabetical list of the authors who wrote all the works that are within the editions currently on the site. This is how you'd arrange any collection. Let's go and take a look at one of those author pages. Jane Austen, we have several editions of her work, but here the actual works themselves nicely set out with their publication dates. Of course, to do this, we've also had to identify our text in XML, and that opens up the possibilities of very accurate search. So it becomes easy to start doing very precise searches. Let's take a look for fish in the works of Jane Austen. And here we are, 14 items with fish. First one here, a letter written from Bath. Don't tell her about the exorbitant price of fish. Salmon, two shillings and nine pennies per pound, the whole fish. Um, we have some other results. My favorite fish in Jane Austen is this one from the Juvenalia, from Love and Friendship, with all her erratic spelling of friendship, and the letter from friend Laura to our narrator, in which she warns her to beware the unmeaning luxuries of Bath and the stinking fish of Southam. So you can see that putting these additions into XML, taking their traditional print elements and translating those into XML, it enables us both to display the different elements in appropriate ways, and it opens up the content. On one hand, a very simple discovery, the browsing of authors, that kind of thing. And on the other hand, to very precise journeys, things like that search. Now, there's also a much less glamorous axis than search, but I think it's ultimately more exciting, which more than anything else, the digitization of these texts bring alive. And Michael mentioned the importance of citation and its complement, the ability to resolve citation, the ability to navigate straight to a particular acts or scenes or lines, because it's those precise references are how all secondary scholarship in the humanities identifies what it's talking about. So what we've done is taken those line numbers that we saw in the margin of the Christopher Smart poem out of the margin, and we've made them a core part of the data. Now, that opens up a lot of exciting possibilities, which I'll just show you some of them now. Now, I should flag, this has been painful to implement. 
the variety of numbering systems one finds in these editions of very varying content produced at varying times. And we're not quite at the bottom of the barrel yet, but we're working to make sure that more and more of our texts support the kind of things that uh, I'm just about to show you. Now, you've all had time to read that very fine Jane Austen letter. So the first advantage we get is that one can resolve reference. So imagine I'm reading an article which casually refers me to Milton's description of Vulcan's fall, Paradise Lost, book one, line 740, as if I should know it, and I don't. Well, I can go straight there. Milton, Paradise Lost, book one, line 740. Paradise Lost, book one, and we spin to 740. And these great lines about from morn to noon he fell, from noon to noon. And that, of course, is how anyone would refer to this bit of Paradise Lost. Let's imagine I'm, um, I'm referred to the Roman poet Propertius. His allusion to the story of Niobe in uh, book three, poem 10, Line eight, let's go there. Well, in this case, we've got some choices because we've got a, a full dress edition of this. We've got a translation of it. We've got an Oxford classical text of it. Uh, let's choose the, the full dress edition. And here we are. We go straight there to that line. And of course, if we look at the notes about that passage, the story of Niobe, they're crammed full of more references. So compare Ovid, Metamorphoses, book six, line four six. Um, compare Hamlet, one two one four nine. Okay, let's compare Hamlet. Off we go to Hamlet. And here we are, like Niobe, all tears. So I can just follow it up instantly. When we were doing the research for this, something that everyone that we talked to said was, save me time. Don't make me have to postpone things. And how many times has one jotted down a reference and thinking, well, I'll follow that up when I go to the library. Now you can follow those references up. There's, a, there's another benefit that a meet that follows too. So I've I've taken a look at, it, at this, and I think, yeah, that, like Niobe, all tears. That's the killer quotation. I'm going to make a note of that. And we have a little widget that enables you to copy and paste. But what's interesting here is this URL. Now, because all these line numbers are identified in the data, because this text of Hamlet is the six, is number six in all our texts. You can see we've got a lot of zeros, so we're expecting to grow. We've got a URL that will take us to that very line. So if I paste that URL in, we should reload to that line. And there we go. So that means I can transmit a link to that line. Because it's transparent, too, this 12149, there's nothing, we're not asking people to learn another system. One can start making up these. So I think there's, there's quite a famous line in Hamlet at Act 3, Scene 1, line 57. Off we go. We can resolve that. And there we go, to be or not to be. So you could write an essay on a Hamlet, and you could pepper it with references. Every single one it could be a hyperlink, jumping the reader to a passage they're quoting. So that notion of taking away the blockages, of bringing the primary texts that are the real objects of humanity scholars closer to them, to, it's not about just finding content, whether it's by browsing or searching, but it's also about referring to it. Now that last case where I've got the URL that includes the particular instance of this text. Now, it's no surprise, it's a URL, of course it should work. But if you think about it, shouldn't 
any citation that one can read and understand as a person, any properly formatted citation, shouldn't that be able to get you to the right place too? If I can pause it, shouldn't I be able to jump straight to it? Um, and so that's what we're now beginning to work on. And here's a sneak preview of something which we haven't rolled out yet. So uh, this is a dramatic world first. Um, I'm going to jump out of Osseo and go to another website. Um, this is called Trollops Apollo. This is a website dedicated to looking at classical illusions in, in the world of Anthony Trollope. And this is nothing to do with OUP. I just looked around on the web and, and found this. And you can see that this, uh, this entry in their blog is about a line in Virgil to near Timeo Danaus et Dona Ferentes, I fear Greeks even when they bear gifts. And down here is that source, Virgil Aeneid 2.49. Now, we can read that, and with a little JavaScript book, bookmarklet on my browser bar, I can throw that back at Ossia. And here we are. And again, we've got a translation, or we've got a Latin text. Let's go to the Latin text, because we're hardcore. Aeneid, book two, line 49. Tomeo Donas et Dona Ferentes. I was just going to show you one last thing that comes out of that, um, that ability to join those lines together. Um, I jumped off to the Latin text of uh, Aeneid two, but Truth to tell, my Latin is a bit rusty. What, of course, you need is a translation to go with it. Now, because all these texts use the same lineation, especially in the classics where these numbering schemes have been fixed, well, let's get a different edition down. Let's get our translation down. And... There we go. Now we're looking at two completely separate editions, uh, but we can link them together because they've got the same lines, and we can move through them together. And that means that, yep, right, I need to know where's, what is this to our denial of Denifrentes? I am afraid of denials, not least when they offer donations. So we can join these things that work together together so people can use them all joined up. So I'm going to hand back to Michael now, but I hope I've shown how our approach has been to listening to the calls from Michael, from our editorial board, from librarians and other scholars. We've managed to get that combination of keeping the structure, keeping fidelity to the print edition, but on the other hand, also having the affordances of XML enabling us to show those elements in a way appropriate to online and to make those elements more and more easy to use. So, Michael, back to you. Well, thanks, Rupert. I, I think it's important to point out that um, these editions on Oxford Scholarly Editions Online are are a kind of a hybrid between print and digital because almost all of them were born in print, but now we've tried to find a way to use the affordances of the digital to make them come alive again, um, which means in part that if a library doesn't have a obscure scholarly edition from 1953 from Oxford University Press and it's not widely available, well, that can exist online. It doesn't matter that it's out of print. Um, or, or I remember a few years ago, I wanted to get uh, my hands on the, the correspondence of Alexander Pope. Um, and uh, I discovered that the five volumes cost six hundred dollars was the cheapest one online um, and 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 yet I wanted to be able to use it at home all the time so uh, that that is a, a a really great thing for access. I always ask my students access to what what are you getting access to, and how do you know that you're not just picking up garbage? And a lot of students and a lot of some, many scholars don't always have the bibliographical or textual editing uh, discernment to know which, which editions are the best. 
So that seems important to me. It's also important to point out that Oxford University Press is not limiting this tool to the stable of its own content. The press has, um, at the insistence and with the aid of uh, the editorial team, begun to license in content from other scholarly publishers. So um, the, in the beginning, the first thing we're bringing in is the California edition in 20 volumes of uh, the works of John Dryden. It's, it's the standard text. Um, but, but over time, we'll be licensing in content and, and have a lot in train already from other major publishers, uh, both in the UK and in the United States. That seems to me really important. Uh, but for me, the, the most important takeaway is, is to be able to search across these editions to think about searching, say, in my period, 17th and 18th century literary, philosophical, historical text, and to be searching through those documents all at the same time. And not just searching the primary text itself, but also to be able to search the scholarly notes, and even to be able to search the apparatus criticus. So I could be in my library and come across a manuscript miscellany and, and say, gosh, I wonder if, if, if any of the texts in here were ever used as textual variants in, in, in some scholarly edition. I wonder what work has been done on this. I could punch in the call number uh, of, of the manuscript and see whether or not it appears in the apparatus criticus of, of more than 600 editions. Uh, more than 300,000 pages of print. Um, uh, so, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting tool that I think is going to allow us to ask questions in new ways, to do research in new ways, to teach in a better way. And, uh, to, to me, it's, it's, it's already been transformative in my own teaching and scholarship. And, uh, I think it could be for some other places too. Laura, did you want to jump in here? Well, I, I think now might be a good time to do some Q&A. That'd be great. So Michael and Rupert, I am going to um, choose a couple of questions and whomever is the best person to address the answer, please jump in. Uh, first off, can the text be downloaded to use for data mining? Uh, shall I take that one? That's sure, that's why really not? Good, that is a really good question, and I'm delighted to um, that you've asked it. And I, I can, because at the moment we, you can grab the uh, grab the text, but at the moment we're not yet able to provide a well-structured version of the of the data, and that's something that I very much want to press for. Um, so having people call for it is great. Um, I can tie that together with I noticed some of the questions about saying is this TEI um, and what standards being used now, and someone else I noticed saying uh, our publishers. Um, it, they'll probably using their own. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid the XML is in our own proprietary standard, which is a kind of historical consequence of the fact that when we started putting uh, content online, say in the two, in the early 2000s, our DTDs evolved from there, and we therefore used variations in those DTDs for this. So it's our own XML format. But clearly, once we start thinking about data takeaways, we need to think about a, uh, a TEI export format. That's something that I'm pursuing here. I'm, so it's great to hear someone call for that. I'm particularly pleased to have that, too, because um, Rupert and I have been discussing this for at least four years. 
And, and from the point of view of the digital humanities end rather than the publishing end, um, you want to be able to download it and you want to be able to then make your own, not just to data mine it, but you want to be able to make your own digital objects from it, it seems to me. Uh, you want to alter it in, in ways that you're creating a new tool yourself. And um, I know that the, the academic, as it were, scholarly side the, of the editorial board have been, you know, saying to the press for a long time, we need to find a way to do this. And we, we understand that you have proprietary markup. Um, and that's great because this thing runs like a top. But at the same time, the next step in the evolution of this as a tool really ought to be to, to be able to download it, to do some data mining, and then even to be able to take that digital object and to, to transform it in or tag it in, in, in new ways that would be um, purpose-built for the individual scholar or, or the, the instructor and her class might even download it and, and develop a tagging uh, scheme for it that would enable them to answer new kinds of research questions. I think we have time for one more question. Um, does the Loeb Library Online have the ability to search tagged items like we just saw via the OSEO plugin? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, I'm not surprised to hear you compare the Loeb Library, um, which I think is really a very smart thing. I mean, I think it's a, a slightly different thing here, um, but it's a very smart thing. We have a family connection. Uh, our developers were the same people who, who developed that. Um, I'm afraid I don't know exactly how far down the line they've gone of trying to um, unpack the various work milestones from within the work. Yeah, it's not it's not clear to me either. Um, so I, I'm 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 sorry not to be able to answer the question. Uh, but of course, anybody who's online and not in presenter mode <laughs> can probably just go check really quickly and let us all know. So maybe just one last question. Um, I'm going to read the setup for this question because then it will make the best sense. Uh, Peter from Edmonton writes, this project reminds me a fair deal of what has been done on the Perseus project and also what can be done on the Canadian Writing and Research Collaboratory's dynamic table of context. How does the OUP online in, enhance the work on these projects? Um, it's, it's a, I'm a huge admirer of the Perseus project. Um, I was a classist myself. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. Um, and clearly, it supports the abilities. Um, some of it's the interrogation it enables of the dictionary. Some of the lexical stuff that they've done is just terrific. Um, I think, however, that the notion of citability is something that we as a publisher are able to bring to this site, and that these editions are modern um, authoritative editions, which we're now reflecting online, and therefore they really can be cited in scholarly literature, and they will remain stable. I think. I think that's one of the things that we're really bringing. And even in a case, uh, this may be, this may seem, um, uh, I see Stephanie Frampton from Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, has, has answered our question in the chat room, uh, for which thank you, Stephanie. Um, but but it, it seems to me that even in cases where Rupert deduced the fact that there are um, more than 100 years worth of scholarly editions um, available through this tool, even when a particular edition has gone out of fashion, 
um, been supplanted by a better edition um, by you know a different press, different editors. Uh, there will still be a large body of scholarly material, uh, you know, journal articles, for example, people's books, that will be using that, that antecedent edition. And one of the great things to do is to be working, you know, with some, you know, looking at the range of articles on a particular subject and say, well, gosh, I don't, I'm not sure the evidence bears that out. What edition was he using? Oh, okay. I can get that online right away through Osseo, um, even though that's not the current edition of record. And 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 sometimes that's important too because you want to compare. Well, what did somebody do in 1951, and what are people doing now, and and how have these readings changed? So there's something to know here too. I think about the history of scholarship and the history of scholarly editions. And, and there's something powerful in here, too, to be excavated about um, the reception history and the citation history uh, of particular primary texts over time. And, um, and, and I think that that, for those who are so inclined, uh, can, be, can be very helpful. I, I, too, am a great admirer of um, Perseus. And I think that in, in some ways it's good to, to pay homage to uh, the digital tool that, that got us all thinking in, in a new way. Okay. I think we are going to wrap up today's webinar. Um, I'd like to give our present presenters all a virtual round of applause for spending some time with us today and sharing some great information. We really appreciate your insights. And thank you to everyone for your patience today. We started with, with um, a glitch, and we really appreciate your sticking with us. Just a reminder, we have recorded today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice that includes instructions on accessing the archived version. Thanks again to all of our participants for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's session. Please have a great rest of the day.